Thanks. Thanks for the warm welcome. And like Ernest mentioned, you know, I'm very grateful to have been around from some of the early days. And this is such a wonderful event to see both so many new faces as well as people who have been around interacting and talking about all sorts of new use cases, new places to take Rust. So I wanted to really thank you all for giving me the opportunity to sort of close this out. Um, for those of you whom I haven't met, my name is Lars, uh, like Ernest mentioned, and I run our compiler and runtime teams at uh, Google Android. So in addition to Rust, I get to see a lot of folks who are developing in C++, in Java, in Kotlin, get to support them all. And so I'm excited to talk with you a little bit today about the things that we've learned specifically about our Rust migration. Now, because it's the end of the day, uh, I'd like to be a little bit, uh, incite some interest, and in particular, rage on the internet. Um, there's nothing that makes people more angry on the internet than talking about benchmarks, except talking about developer productivity. And so today, I wanted to sort of end our day by ruffling a few feathers, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, now, you've all seen the website. Unfortunately, I don't get to write a lot of code these days, so I like to talk about these as the value propositions of Rust. And these three value propositions have sort of been up on the website for most of the time that I've worked uh, with the language. Um, and so I'm going to go through these in turn and talk about just how these value propositions are holding up when we talk about them to other executives and pointy-haired bosses like myself, and then really center in on the productivity side of it. So I think performance is really the easy one for us, right? This value proposition is really, really well sold. Every single year, there are new stories of people who have either come to Rust for the first time, who have ported a system, or who have rewritten a system in Rust and seen amazing benefits, whether it's around memory usage or uh, CPU usage or something like that. I have three up here that were sort of seminal. The Dropbox article from 2016, which really introduced the idea of rewriting web services in Rust to a larger community. The really great article from Figma in 2018, which sort of showed how you could start to build complicated front-end web services and have Rust be an important part of that and reduce the costs. Um, and then the UV article from very recently, which showed how you could rewrite some of your command line tools and again brought Rust, not that folks in the ML community and the Python community were not aware of Rust, but really brought it to the forefront and helped people see it. Now, you could do a whole keynote on everything around the performance gains that we've seen each year. This is not that keynote. Um, but I do want to say that this is largely put to rest, that at this point, when you talk about Rust as a way to get productivity, uh, people do not question it. Now, if you wind back 10 years, we were not really sure about that, right? We were carrying custom LLVM patches. People didn't know if we were going to be able to get similar performance to C. Um, and really, other than some questions around cross-language optimization and making sure that we support all of the same modern features that come out across the C++ tool chains, I think that this is really put to bed and you can, you can rest your hat on Rust as a highly productive language. Now, when we hop over to reliability and, and security, I would say even six months ago, this was a really tough conversation. I would go and I would talk to people and they would say, wait, wait, you have an unsafe keyword. That means we should all write C++ until the heat death of the universe. Um, and so that is really, but fortunately we've seen a large growth in awareness of the challenges with, with using non-memory safe languages sort of across the ecosystem. And we've seen increased interest, not only from the White House, but uh, in the US, which you've seen this one in a couple of other talks today, um, but also across many nations. Everyone is sort of recognizing that software plays such a crucial role in not only our critical infrastructure for our governments, but also for the end users and the software that they're getting delivered. Now, I do want to admit, 
unsafe code, we need to do more about it, but I worry about unsafe code in the same way that my Java teams worry about JNI code, in the same way that my teams who are writing web services worry about the virtual machine and runtime. We always need to be improving the quality of the entire software stack, and the more that we can do to prove more and more important properties, the better. But every order of magnitude reduction in the overall surface of the, the surface of security vulnerabilities that are possible really improves the state of software. And so I would say, again, for reliability, this one is sort of put to rest. I don't even have to argue about it anymore. Well, except maybe on the internet a little bit. Now, productivity is sort of interesting here. If you looked at the other two value propositions, we bring performance, we bring reliability. And then if you read the productivity tier, it says, we have some amazing tools, documentation, and culture. And that's right, like we have a lot of elements. And those are, I'm, I'm fortunate in my 25 year career to have been part of the beginning of many programming languages and gone through the ecosystem. And I think that Rust has uniquely invested in tooling, in documentation, and in culture compared to all the other languages I've been with. But tools alone do not a productive environment make. And so the question is, how can we start to talk a little bit more about productivity? And so there's this question of sort of what does it mean to be productive as a software developer? Now, there's sort of uh, two big common approaches in the software engineering field. Uh, the first one, was, which was popularized by DeMarco and Lister and Peopleware, uh, is sort of to do A-B tests. You have two teams, they both write the same thing, you've controlled for something, whether it's the company they worked at or whether they work in an open-air office. Um, that's also where the 10x programmer meme came from. And so that's well storied, but it's kind of an expensive way to evaluate uh, productivity. Now, the software engineering field has taken a, a lot of detours over the last 10 or 15 years through looking at lines of code or number of CLs. Unfortunately, all of those metrics, while well-intentioned, end up being a target rather than actually a useful measure of productivity. So there's some really great research out of Google as well uh, from some of my colleagues. We mainly anchor these days on self-reported developer productivity. Turns out, if you can get them to report it anonymously, most developers know if they're productive or not. Um, and so you can survey your developers and you can ask them, hey, how, how are things going? Do you feel productive every day? Um, and then we've looked into sort of what are the contributors to that? Now, these aren't necessarily things that we would just ramp them to 11. We're not just gonna say, code review speed is the only thing that matters. We have to review all, all pull requests within 33 seconds. But a bunch of these things, when they're bad, tend to degrade productivity. Um, and so I'll go through some, some data we have around some of these metrics and developer productivity, but you know, it's, it's kind of disappointing. It'd be great if we had some more A-B tests that we could use. If only there was a company that had hundreds of developers who had been rewriting tens of systems over the last couple of years for us to mine the data on. Oh wait, that's us. Um, so we do actually have some data to share today. Uh, we have at this point at Google rewritten a large number of systems, whether we've ported them incrementally or rewritten them from C++. And so we actually have some very concrete things that we can say today. I have two big ones to share with you. Number one, uh, when we've rewritten systems from Go into Rust, we've found that it takes about the same size team, about the same amount of time to build it. That is, there's no loss in productivity when moving from Go to Rust. And the interesting thing is, we do see some benefits from it. So we see reduced memory usage in the services that we've moved from Go. And we also, similar to what um, uh, Nicholas reported in the Vercel port earlier today, we see a decreased defect rate over time in those services that have been rewritten in Rust. So increasing correctness. Now the second one, the really juicy one, is looking at comparing our rewrites of C++ code into Rust. And in every case, we've seen a decrease by more than 2x in the amount of effort required to both build the services in, in Rust, as well as maintain and update those services written in Rust. And so that's a really huge thing for us because C++ code is very expensive. It's, these are large teams, it's a lot of work, there's a lot of risk, and so I'm really happy to be able to share some of that data. 
But in some ways, the data isn't, isn't totally satisfying, right? Come, let's come back to that earlier thing about what drives developer productivity. We can't just say, like, well, Russ is more productive. OK, we're done. Let's, let's all go home. We sort of want to dig in and say, what are the elements of the uh, various set of tools and uh, documentation and techniques within the Rust ecosystem that lead to this increased productivity? or at least that don't cause developers to be unproductive. And so one of the first questions that people often have is, um, how long is it going to take us to ramp up our developers? Right? That's a huge meme in the industry that it takes a long time to ramp people up. And so um, we asked, you know, when learning Rust, how long did it take you to become sufficiently productive to contribute to the Rust code base without worrying about the language? And so for about two thirds of the developers, who again are experienced Google developers, these are all internal Google surveys, um, it took them two months or less. Now, in the abstract, that sounds like, well, I don't, I don't really know where to do it. But again, putting on one of my other hats, I also manage the Java teams at, at Google. And you may be aware we have a similar migration going on in the Java ecosystem, where we're moving people from Java to Kotlin. And the number that we use at Google to reflect about how long it takes us to take a Java developer and get them contributing to Kotlin is eight weeks. So it takes about as long for us to retrain a C++ developer to use Rust as it does for us to train a Java developer to use Kotlin. And so could we do better? Certainly. We're always improving the documentation. Even since this survey was done in 2022, we've improved the, the, quality of the, the quality and comprehensiveness of the training. There's a ton of research being done, not only at Google, but especially outside in the ecosystem, both the academic industry as well, figure out how we can train people up better on Rust, and the quality of the tooling and the error messages continues to improve. So I only expect these numbers to get better over time. But it's not just about delivering code, right? We want to know when are you as productive in your new language as you were in the old one. That is, you're not just checking code in. You actually feel like someone gives you a task. You go ahead. You complete it. You get it in. Um, and within, again, within two months, about a third of the folks are, are feeling as productive as they were in their other language. And you double those, and you get to, you know, in four months, you get about 50%. And that's interesting for two reasons. Number one, it's, it's pretty feasible people you know, to, to ramp up it within that time. And the other one is that people do indeed feel as productive in Rust as they felt in their previous language. And we surveyed folks across a variety of languages, C++, they were coming from Java, they were coming from Python, they were coming from Go. And so it really gives us a good sense that, um, yes, it takes some time, but people do feel like they are as productive in Rust as they were in the language that they previously were writing in. But one of the biggest latencies for anyone who manages a software team is code review time. Uh, it's often not a lot of finger on keyboard time, right? Often people are sitting here going, oh, when's Steve going to review my patch? Oh, it's 6 AM in London. I have to wait for another turn of the crank. And so the question is, how hard is it to uh, review code in Rust? And I thought this was super interesting in that um, even though these are all people who were, most of the people being surveyed here were relatively new to Rust. So they were, you know, many of them were decade plus experienced Python or C++ programmers. Um, when we asked them how do Rust code reviews compare to code reviews in another language, about a little over half of them said that, that Rust is actually easier to review. And when we sort of look into why that is, we get to sort of the most incredible question of the survey, the one that kind of blew all of us away, which is the confidence that people have in the correctness of the Rust code that they're looking at. So in comparison to code in other languages, how confident do you feel that your team's Rust code is correct? And so 85% of people, like that is a massive number. I could get, not get 85% of this room to agree that we like M&Ms. Um, like 85% of people believe that uh, it, their Rust code is more likely to be correct than the other code within, within their system. That is just and I've never seen it. Uh, I've been through more than one language survey in my life, um, and I've never seen those kind of numbers before. And so coming back to code quality as sort of the key indicator of productivity, people really believe that they are writing Rust code, they feel productive putting it together, and when this code is done, it's at a high quality level. But 
why do they think this code is at a high quality level? And so I sort of want to close out by looking at a couple of side-by-side -side, uh, pieces of code here. Now, this is all production quality code. None of this was made just to injure the projector screen, right? This is all, everything you will see here is production quality code sh shipping on millions of devices out in production in the world written by professional programmers. And so we're going to look at it side by side and see which one you think is easier to review. This may be a biased crowd, though. So the details here aren't super important. I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. But the first project that I want to talk about is our DNS over HTTP3 server. And I'm going to compare the C++ code on the left with the Rust code on the right. And so this is professional C++ code. If you've ever written any of it or you remember it or someone's told you about it, um, this is sort of idiomatic C++ code, right? We've got a variety of functions. There's some state machines that are encoded in integers. We've got a bunch of conditional flags that we sort of or together. There's a bunch of conditional branches. There's some to-dos, because of course there are. Um, and then a bunch of log statements that will tell you if you kind of missed a case and went over. And then on the other side, you have Rust code where we've encoded all of, those, all of those flags into an enum. We have pattern matching, exhaustive pattern matching. And uh, you know sort of if you've missed a case or not. And I don't want you to think as much about the creation of this code, because you can always imagine like being in a wonderful fugue and writing the code correctly. I want you to think about like two or three years later when we add another enum. And so you have these two models. You now have to edit this code to handle an additional state within it. And in the case of the Rust code, you add it to the enum. The compiler thinks really, really hard and tells you if you missed any cases. And in this case, you add it to the enum, and then you bring someone back out of retirement who still understands this code <laughs> <laughs> at great expense, and they think about it for a few weeks, <laughs> and then they tell you you missed a couple of cases, and you sort of repeat that until they make enough money to retire, and then you land the patch and hope for the best. Um, like, it's really, really hard to reason about code like this, even for the most knowledgeable people who really understand the domain, who also are C++ experts, who also have enough time to keep the entire code base in their head, uh, a code base that, by the way, is still landing new CLs and PRs every single day, right? So th you're, you're sitting there with a moving target. That's just a really, really hard problem. And Rust makes that so much easier for the edits. And that's most of the software development experience, right? It's very rare you're sitting here in an open buffer like, oh my gosh, I'm going to write a new Bluetooth server today. Most of the time, you come in and you're, you're adding a new flag. You're fixing a bug because there's some headset that isn't pairing correctly. And you need to be able to make those those corrections very easily, and ideally without having to bring the, the seasoned developer out of retirement and back in to take a look at the code, um, because there are a lot of blood, buggy, buggy Bluetooth headsets. And so for the second one, <coughs> I want to start off with a quote from the security team. Android's experience with Rust has been excellent. My team built the first major component, Keystore, which is a medium-sized component with significant concurrency. We're now three years in, and it has been basically flawless. Um, for those of you who haven't worked in production commercial software, <laughs> <laughs> the words basically flawless and systems code do not usually appear in the same sentence. <laughs> And so if we, if, again, if we look at the code here and we go to, to do a comparison of it, we have more idiomatic C++, but you can tell that this is a little bit newer because somebody got really excited about stud move and uh, memory models and macros. And there are some places where we move things and we, we change the ownership of the memory. And there are some places where we don't. And some of them are integers, but some of them appear to be pointers to data. And if you're not terrified right now, you, you, you're probably not, you haven't been a C++ programmer. Um, and so and if you go over to the right-hand side, again, idiomatic Rust. We don't, we're not worrying about memory management. Again, all of the error handling is really well encapsulated. I think the worst thing you can say about that Rust code is that it has a little bit of right word drift. Um, and so maybe there's, maybe, maybe there's a couple of uh, RFCs we could file on that one. Um, but other than that, but if, if the 
the thing you're most worried about in Rust is exceeding your 132 column line limit, like those are good problems to have. Um, the things you're worried about over here are much more fundamental. And again, you're probably not using the words uh, basically flawless. So anyway, I want to say I want to thank you all for sitting through this set of examples and uh, learning a little bit more about productivity and how we think about the value proposition for Rust. Um, and I hope I've encouraged all of you today to talk about this third pillar a little bit more because I think we don't talk enough, especially with executives and especially in the year that we're in right now, about how productive our teams could be, but they're still stuck writing C++. Thank you.